This is Brian Nickel, your host for AEC Perspectives, a podcast by RSNH. Today, we are going to talk emerging trends in construction management with Doug Geiger, an executive vice president for RSNH's construction management business unit. Doug joined RSNH nearly 40 years ago. He says he grew up through the CEI industry all over Florida, from Miami to St. Augustine to Panama City and ending in Orlando. In his current role, Doug develops and implements policy across a platform of projects for mostly DOT clients from Seattle, Washington to the Eastern Seaboard and from Michigan to the state of Florida. During his tenure, Doug has been highly involved in the transportation industry direction of CE&I and held several roles in ACEC of Florida leadership, including the Transportation Committee Chairman's position. A safety champion, Doug Geiger truly cares that his people get home safely each and every day. It's what has made his leadership and presence so notable for RSNH and our industry. A fun fact, Doug carried the Olympic torch as a bicyclist from d to Daytona in 1996 on its way to the Olympic Games in Atlanta. Please welcome Doug Geiger. Doug, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited. This is my first podcast, so I'm I'm here for you and whatever questions we have and wherever this conversation goes, I'm excited. Well, that's great. So we're going to talk emerging trends and construction management and get your thoughts uh, on this very important aspect of the AEC industry. My first question, Doug, is what do you see as the top two or three emerging trends in construction management? So the, the big thing for us, I'll tell you, has been the GPS surveying. It, 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 instead of having a survey crew, we can get out there with a team and, and a rover, and we can get very, very close with all the new satellites that are across the, our, you know, the skies. We can get very close and we can put one or two people on a job and get close to elevations of where they need to be. So that helps the contractor. And that also ties into the AMG, what's going on with the automatic machine grading for our contractors. So you're starting to eliminate some of the human errors that used to occur. Somebody misread the plans, transposed the wrong uh, um, num number. So we're starting to see that as probably one of the biggest trends going on right now across our platform. And with that, you also got the 3D plans. So a lot of con a lot of uh, the states are going to 3D plans now. So that's one of the big things. It almost all kind of ties together from when you have GPS surveying to 3D plans to AMG. So the contractors can tie it all together. So that's I think that's probably one of the number one for me. Um, as you know, in construction, you know, we don't have a lot of places where innovation because they're one offs. We're tying into something was built 40 or 50 years ago. So you can't you can't um, innovation. is very hard when you're starting to do one offs and you're tying into something that's been up for 50 or 60 years. So but but again, um, another one that we are also using, we got a drone fleet our drone pilots. We have about 30 drone pilots across the country. So with the drones, what we're finding is you you can use that to get to places you may not be able to access easily, whether you're inspecting one of the towers of the, you know, I grew up in Michigan. So you, you got the, you got the uh, Mackinac Bridge. So some of those towers you just can't inspect unless you maybe send up a drone. So we're using that in, uh, Corey Rogers is using that for us. And, and it's not, it's, it gives you an idea. We're not using it sole source, but, you know, it gives you an idea. So the drone program or, or um, another place we're using it in Florida, we have stormwater pollution prevention. So we have silt fence around all the surrounding the whole project. So we don't let any of erosion run off the job. Well, one of our guys programmed the drone to follow the path of the silt fence. So whenever we get a significant event or weekly, he sends that drone and it follows the same pattern. 
so we have an idea and a record and you can send somebody you know you can send the contractor out you're not wasting the contractor's time we're not wasting our time because the way the way the industry is you can't waste anybody's time the it's because we don't have the workforce so we're trying to improve on efficiency so those are a couple of the trends that i see um certainly brian we'll, we'll talk about it later but safety uh, innovations and safety are all the time coming up where and it, it's mostly about the health of our workers and making sure they're safe whether it's one of our things we, we flipped our fleet over where we've got vehicles now uh, our our inspectors the vehicle is their office so we wanted to have as safe as possible so pre collision prevention from the front cameras surrounding it automatic braking lane departure controls so those are some of the innovations that are rolling down into our industry that we're really accepting. So we have kind of a, a, a combination of technology that's helping drive efficiency, but it's also giving better results. So when you look at the GPS surveying, we're used to have maybe 10, two crews or eight or 10 people out. You can do it with two or three and get even better accuracy or at least through the satellite system, almost near uh, point accuracy in, in your measurements, which helps on down through the construction process. Is that right? It helps everybody. Our culture in the RSNH is not to be, aha, we got you and you made a mistake. Our culture is to get ahead of it. And if the contractor builds it right the first time, we're partners in this to get it done for our clients. So yeah, you want to make sure we're helping them get it, get the results that we need. And, and that's what it does. It validates what, what did Ronald Reagan say, trust but verify. That's our role. Right. <laughs> well, and I think the, the interesting aspect is this technology allows us to get in, get the job done and get out. So the traveling public is not delayed. So, so the delay cost to those that actually pay for these improvements is reduced. And, and that in these days also has a major safety component, both for our people, because they're not out there uh, all the time and as much time as in the past, and for the traveling public who who we can uh, minimize the work zones that they have to travel through. Absolutely. We get out of their way and let them get at it. I really uh, appreciated uh your your description of our, our of our drones and and how we use our drones having 30 drone pilots and using it as an enhancement to the work that we're doing on the ground and i think that can you talk about that a little bit and how impactful that's been so one of the as everybody in our everybody everywhere in the world knows there's a shortage of labor but we still want to get the work done we need to get the work done so we're using it as a tool to also um, efficiencies of instead of seven sending a typically when you wanted to measure an area, you got to send a three man crew out. And now we can use our drones. The accuracy has gotten so good and our clients are understanding and understand the, the improvements. We can use a drone to fly an area and come up with a square yard for payment of whether it's sod or asphalt or any of the any of the areas that we have to come up with the quantity for payment. And, you know, the more accurate you are with your payment, then everybody's more happy. It eliminates a lot of um, questions about, did we get it right? And, and that's always, you want to be fair and get them paid for what they did. All this technology is creating a workforce that is a little more technology advanced than when I started 40 years ago. And we didn't have tablets. We had carbon paper. And back, Brian, we actually, uh, we uh, arm our, or give our inspectors tablets to go in the field. And they can they can get very accurate information. You get instant information right away. You can send that, take pictures, send it to a senior project engineer who's running the job. And and that's another thing where you know I'm all these all these things have taken time. They've come all across time, but to me they don't seem innovation. But to a lot of people, it is innovation. Well, to me, Doug, it is because I think you've you've captured from carbon copies, literally carbon copies in the field, to a tablet that can send a photo or a video directly to a senior project manager who can make a decision that can help the contractor speed up, slow down where you need to, come in and analyze. Those are 
massive improvements in efficiency. And it gives us the ability to make decisions real time. We don't have to go back to the office and sit down, and analyze things and then ride out to the field. And, you know, so it, and time is money for all of us, no matter what profession you're in, time is money. So if we can make those decisions now with with the relevant information we have at the hand in hand, then then everybody is much more happier and the work is getting done faster, which goes back to your original point of getting getting it open to the public and getting out of their way so goods and freight and passengers can get through our corridors our clients corridors so i i i know you mentioned this notion about hiring and the in the labor issues that we're facing i want to talk about that for a second it seems like everyone in our industry is hiring and adding to the challenge of competing for workers is whether we have the kind of skill sets that employers like RSNH are seeking. Uh, what are are your thoughts, and what what thoughts do you have about addressing workforce issues that we're facing today and that are coming at us in the future? I would say the workforce has changed, and and I will say out of the construction management. Uh, uh, it's, I would say probably 60 to 70% of my workforce have an education or a degree beyond high school. We have a more educated workforce. Adds a couple of things. It, decisions are made faster at the lowest level in the field, which, which means the job gets going faster. Everything keeps moving forward faster. You know, with limits, you gotta have boundaries. But if you arm people with education with boundaries, then things can happen quicker with the educated workforce. Not everybody knows that the construction inspectors, that's a, I think you've seen that across the country as more education in our workforce. But that leads to, we have to get the pipeline fuller coming from the STEM programs and elementary, high school. So you will see more of the AE industry and the contractors trying to get reach down deeper earlier that there is a career, a good career, I've never been without need in my career, 40 years, been sitting on the sidelines. It's been a great career. So we are doing more presentations to uh, elementary schools. Te I, I was a teacher for a day. Well, I have five kids that went through school. So I always volunteered for teacher of the day, went in and showed them how we make concrete, asphalt, suited them up in their safety gear. And, and you'll see that you're seeing that more and more created little bridge models for them. Um, so there's different different ways to get involved earlier on in our career. And, and I will tell you one of the other things, um, traditionally the math hasn't changed in 40 years, what we're teaching from the ABET accredited colleges. But what I've put out, and there's others out there, same message, let's teach engineering math that we need now. There was a trend where we had mathematicians teaching math to engineers. And my daughter, who's a freshman at University of South Florida this year, and she's going into environmental engineering, it was the first time I've seen in her, her first semester classes, engineer, math for engineers and uh, calculus for engineers. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're hearing us, maybe, that teaching relevant math to us now. And so what I'm getting to, Brian, is let's not weed out smart people with uh, with something that that we don't need or don't practice anymore because of the computers and AI and all the different things. Now you need to have an understanding of math. I'm not saying we don't need that in our in our um industry. But we don't we don't necessarily need a PhD in math. We need math that is applicable, practical and pragmatic for the job at hand and that now can be tailored and, yes. and we can enhance that with the technology that we have in the tablets that you mentioned earlier. And we're not weeding out kids who want to be in our profession. We'll go to the colleges and have uh, luncheons or, or after dinner pizza parties with some of the professional organizations, student chapter professional organizations, not just show up for the um, not just show up when we want to go to the uh, career fairs try and get to know some kids. We'll do presentations to some of the professors that will allow us to talk about construction management. Not everybody, and one of the things, we're in the field, not everybody wants to be in the field and the sun and the heat, the cold, but it gives you an independence from, uh, I worked design for a year or so for Dave Sweeney, 
in a design <laughs> office in a cubicle and, and you got the prairie dog and where you'd pop up and you'd say something to somebody. But in the field, you have a little more independence and, and um, we try to share that with with that, with our folks, uh, the young people coming in and show them there's a career outside design. It's not right. everybody wants to sit in a design office. So. And, and so we have this in our AEC industry, kind of a whole bunch of different unique positions that if you like being outside and outdoors and that's your thing and you, and you can gain some math experience, we can get you in the field with the latest of technology, the latest of efficiency, and then you're watching and helping create uh, a, a an outcome, an infrastructure outcome that you can stand back and look at and go, I helped build that, that now is improving the lives of my community. You you hit it on the head. You, you, you know, when I drive around the state of Florida with my kids, I'm like, I was part of that. Our company is part of that. And you leave, and for me, you leave something behind. And, and I mean, but there's such a team behind it from the designer, the contractor, the client, you know, but you do at the end of the day, leave something behind that improves your community. Oh yeah, that's 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 the exciting part for me. I, you know, I miss the field. All right, I tell you, because that was part of it. Yeah. Sure. So when you when you think about um, reaching down, so back in the day uh, when you and I first started in this industry, some 35, 40 years ago, uh, we weren't talking to elementary or middle school or high school students. We were really focused in the in the post-secondary, maybe an associate's degree or someone who's getting a bachelor's and recruiting from there. But now we're actually going and starting the recruiting in our elementary and middle school uh, in, in those schools to get the interest because we need those, those individuals to come into our business where they can make a great living and, and they can raise a family and they can then have an impact in their community. What do you think is the key for us to to attract that that younger individual that's maybe thinking about what they're going to do in their career or may, maybe maybe not? You've been in schools. Tell us how you go about that. For our industry, hands-on is huge. Um, but you also have to have some technology. A lot of the kids nowadays, they in the 3D modeling, I think you're going to, also see some of the kids who went through uh, who are very savvy uh, computer gaming. They can computer model so many things now. Um, it's it's just, you know, it's how you present it and get them excited. You can get excited over making a cookie or you can get excited over so many things, but you got to go with them excitement. And you, and you got to be with them. You got to you got to illustrate and show them examples and show them like what you're doing on a daily basis and how you can enjoy it. You know, I love this notion of how you treat your employees and associates as family and how how that then translates into a safety culture. So let's talk about that a little bit in in 2020. There were 174,000 plus cases of injuries in the construction sector. That's 24% higher than any other industry. And so when you're creating a family, you want to make sure your family's safe. What, what do you see as being done throughout our industry to address safety issues? You talked about one a little bit ago using you know, and keep keeping someone out of a dangerous situation by using technology to look at something. But what are some other measures that that we're looking at in the industry? Brian, it's it's changed tremendously, and and I'm I'm very excited. Every every injury, every fatality hurts hurts everybody around. And, and I'm not going to tell you it's never happened on some of my jobs, forty year career, but we've seen such a sweeping change. From the from the morning meetings that start out the day for the contractor that I I promote our people to attend we're just we're part of the workforce so we ask, attend the monthly more the weekly meetings or, or the daily meetings anytime we have a new operation we encourage our contractors let's let's talk about it with all our team everybody so everybody understands what's going on 
Um, so first thing is make everybody understand they are important and we feel they're important. And we're going to do our best to get them home at the end of each day. Um, we go over those kinds of things from, from what operation that day is going on to the safety culture of we have our monthly lunch and learns where we'll have a young engineer or, or young inspector tr teach everybody. Teaching is the best way to learn it yourself. So we always, we have our monthly safety meetings where we make sure everybody sits down, we have a lunch and we, and we talk about what's going on on the project or what has happened across the country. You know, is there something that happened that we want to get to our folks right away? Um, we have that. Uh, we have our vehicle safety once a month. We have everybody a vehicle training that we go through. We talk about specific topics to keep them safe that we've learned. You know, we follow our, um, we actually have devices in our vehicles that monitor driving. You know, and so we take that and we train the bottom 10% to get better. And if we continue to train the bottom 10% to get better, we're all getting better. And so you you essentially, it, like any family, you create an awareness, right? With your with your morning meetings, your daily meetings, your weekly meetings, your your monthly uh, check ins. So you've got this awareness you've created, and then you're addressing specific issues that that you may face that day on the job. So you bring it to the present. It's not something that may go on somewhere down the way. It's right here and now. And then you drive that into a safety culture is what I hear yeah. you saying. And, and is that your ultimate goal is to have everybody focused around safety and going, getting everybody it, home? It's, it's got to be a component of everybody's work day, no matter what you do. And, and and I will tell you, it's not the lazy ones, too. It's the hard workers, too. Something It's like, oh, they're lazy and that happened. No, sometimes it's the people trying to do above and beyond that it happens to slow down, think about what you're doing. It, it's it's just creating that awareness. So when I I'm a from come from a farming background, and so I had it ingrained in me. Know where the tractor is. Know where the animals are. Know what's above you. That was always first nature for me when I went. So when I came out to the industry, it wasn't that wasn't a big part of my learn. But we're getting these young folks who've never been around any of it before. So we have to teach them proximity to equipment. Look for pinch points overhead. And so it starts day one, starts before they get here. We go through the 10 hour OSHA training. So we've been, uh, I'll tell you some of the, we've ingrained some of the technology. We do the red, we have um, online things that help out, but you're not walking out in the field first day by yourself. You're going with a mentor, a supervisor, a partner to see what's going on. Um, so again, that goes back to the family, but some of the, there is technology coming along too, though, Brian, that's, Pretty exciting. Um, I just heard the other day one of our Jeff Sullivan, who used to work for a contractor, they're putting devices, tracking uh, devices or monitoring or in hard hats now so that that ties to a piece of equipment, which kind of goes to the uh, auto automated machine grading that if there's a proximity to somebody with a hard hat with a, one of those indicators, the machine will stop. So technology is starting to catch up, too. So you're avoiding pinch points. Because there's so many blind spots on some of this equipment that you just can't see. And back in the day, they didn't have backup alarms on dump trucks. Now every truck has a backup alarm. So we're ingraining technology along the way. Um, so I'm excited for some of that to come along. And, it, you know, proximity devices in hard hats is huge that you never had to do before. Yeah, that's an amazing uh, dynamic. I, I hadn't thought of that, but the this automate, you know, we think of automation as as oh, that's that's you know, taking a job away from somebody. But in this case, the automation is literally saving a life. We're using technology in our future to not only save lives, but to make the job go better. Because once there's an accident or an incident, everything stops. And your first concern is your employee or the person involved. And then you have to go through a whole series of, of issues looking at the safety incident. So you're highlighting this. I, I, I had not uh, thought about uh, how we look at a construction worker 
that's out in the field and we can we can essentially put a cone around them of safety and that's that's amazing uh, another thing on some of the buildings that i've seen you have cell free zones so or there's a zone where if you want to be on your phone this is the zone you're in which is out of the work area you know cuz phones face it they're in everybody's pocket everywhere you go no matter what level you are and it's communication is great but it's a distraction and and this kind of goes i'll tell you this goes with our policy uh this this month for august i'm doing three live sessions on distracted driving prevention so we that's our policy mm-hmm. in rsnh is you know, no distract. You're not going to be on your phone while you're driving. That's a distraction and it increases your odds of an accident hugely. And again, we don't want to lose somebody. Can you um, talk a little bit about how you, you know, because in a family, right, you, you have some disagreements over some things or, you know, in any it's any family dynamic. How do you work through those when you're working on some of these projects where you want that family atmosphere, but you also have to get the job done. How do you kind of approach that from a leadership standpoint? You you have to be a listener first. I'll tell you, Brian, any leader has to be a listener first. You have to listen. You get the, you listen to the opinions of everybody in, in that circle. You get the most information you can. I, I've had many contractors. We've uh, over my career and we've always left at the end of the job. We got it done. And, and they have a job. You have to respect their job. You have to teach them your job so they understand what you're doing. You have to share with that with the client. Sometimes we're educating clients, too, that their job is to make money, and, and but they're not out there to take advantage of anybody. So you listen to everybody and, and you come up with the best information you have. And at times you have to be the leader and you have to pick, OK, we're going to do X, not Y, not Z. We're going to do X and, and share Y. Some of the some of the biggest things, if I just say I'm work over your course of your career, you learn things, what to do and what not to do. And I've learned that from many bosses. And uh, you, you got to share. You don't have to share, but you want to have a teaching moment with a lot of people. You become an educator, a teacher. Once I figured that that light bulb went off in my career. OK, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. Then you're able to go, OK, this is why we're doing this. So that then what happens then is they can make the decision next time. So that's what you want to teach, how to make decisions. So you're you're essentially empowering someone through a through a learning process, a teaching process, uh, but you're doing it in a way that gives them that kind of confidence to make the decision when they need to make it. Absolutely. I say spend 10 minutes researching the problem, but after you get to 10 to 15 minutes, then ask somebody above you to help you. That way there's skin in the game. That's kind of how I've approached it, whether I'm dealing with a contractor or a client or my employee. It's, it's like, okay, this, this is why we're doing this. Education. And so the understanding everybody's viewpoint. I want to switch for a quick second before we get into our rapid fire questions and, and kind of look out 10 years to the future. Uh, what excites you most and what changes do you see? I mean, you've talked about a lot of cool technology that that exists today or is being implemented today. What do you think's coming in the future? And, and how are you thinking about that future uh, for uh, the construction management industry? Man, um, there's so many things that are right on the cusp, Brian. And, and construction is the slowest just because, like I said earlier, the one-offs and all that. But when you get into some of the things like barcoding, so where it's things that are pre, pre-made pre that we can bring out to the job set that are barcoded, so it makes everybody's job easier. We don't have to retest it. So documentation, um, sharing of the documents on an instant. Uh, but for me, I think I am, I am so looking forward to when we get autonomous vehicles. That will change the complexion of transportation, which changes how we do things to build things for people. And that, to me, is so exciting when we get to that point. And, you know, what every seven years technology doubles. I think that's the number they put out there. So you're talking, I have no idea what will happen. I mean, I started out without a cell phone back and then we went to the bricks and now we got these phones now. And it's just, I, I don't know. I, 
there's so many things on the rise and I don't even know what the satellites that are going up now and, and you've got, you'll have Wi-Fi everywhere. So you get, again, instant communication and you can see what's going on. I don't ever want to get it to where we're watching jobs from an office. We still have to touch things. We still have to be there. One of the biggest things when I first started my career is I, I didn't know what a, a what an end bent looked like. And so I had, to, I looked at my plans, but I didn't quite get it. So I had to go drive over to other jobs to look at, well, a finish. What is that? So you have a visualization. Now you can pull things up on the internet, 3D modeling. You can see it. You can, yeah, like you said, you can rotate it. Okay. Now I know what it looks supposed to look you like. You literally can go 360 around any object. And, you, you know, we do that in our, when you look at a product online, um, I, I think construction, everyone thinks of construction and the construction sector is dirt and, you know, and concrete and asphalt and steel and all of this out in the field. But it's really at the cusp of a digital revolution, it appears. Is that is that where you're seeing? I do. I don't know where it's going to go, but I feel that, too. And, and the way. Some of the things, the way we can monitor some of these structures, Brian, uh, it was when we see a failure of a structure that is so um, that hits so hard at home to me, uh, could have been prevented. And and now I think the way we can you will see monitoring from afar of of structures that could have been prevented or if they were going to fail, we knew ahead of time and we could either prevent it or, or evacuate or do certain things that to me. So that, again, that saves lives. And we're um, talking about that in the context of the infrastructure embedding technology. So it's smart, right? It's telling you when something is not right so that we can act in advance of a tragedy. And, and yes. the same thing is happening on the, as the example you used with the hard hats, having a device that that is smart that tells the equipment don't back up anymore because there's a person here so do you think this digital revolution is you know do you do you see fairly significant change over the next five to ten years that that rapidly changes not all, not the the business that gets done but the way of doing the business um, the way of doing the business is going to change a little bit, but not, and, and I say that like, you'll see paver paving machines that will get the grade and all that. And, you know, we're working some of the bugs out of that. You won't ever see, there's no guy on the paver. There's no team on the paver. There's, you'll never get away from us. Somebody has to clean up, you know, asphalt that's spilled over. You're ne you're never going to get away from that or the people who pour the concrete, but, uh, you will see efficiencies in. Here's here's the thing I like to tell people because I was asking, me, well, what does CEI do? Why are you out here? You know, we're about 10 percent of the budget. We don't need you. We can do this. And, and I go, look, here, here's the deal with construction management. Every contractor wants to get it 80 percent right from the get go. 80 percent in, in education is great. That's a that's a B. That's a solid B. But in construction, 80 percent. If you design a structure to last 75 years and you get it 80% right, it's only going to last about 40 years if you're lucky, maybe 35 years. That last 10, 15%, you get into that 95, 90 range, that structure is going to last 75 years, if not more than that. It will last, could last double the lifetime because as engineers, we design things for twice for the factor of maybe they didn't get it quite right. Maybe there's maybe there's there is tolerances so in design you design it twice what you need for just in case in construction but if you can eliminate it and narrow down that parameter of how it's built you're going to get it to last 100 years or more or surf on um, repaving so if you get it 80 percent right that that pavement may last five years with the truck traffic we got you know we can only anticipate truck traffic but if you can get it 95 to 100 percent right that's going to last over seven years, it could last into 12 years. Now you're saving money, you're saving resources, you're saving a disruption to the public. So that little 10% of we, what we do, it has huge rewards downstream for staying out of the traffic, longer life, 
cycle, saving on our resources. So I'm not sure, I wanted to make sure I got that out there because a lot of people don't understand construction management. They think we just sit in the office, fill out paperwork or test concrete. No, we add a lot to the project. Well, it's a value proposition. So you've just explained a value proposition for for the end users, for the clients that we work for, and you can take part in that 10% that actually changes the trajectory of the future in a very positive way. And that's what we bring to the table, construction management. That's the knowledge we bring uh, uh, when, when we're out there representing our client who can't be everywhere all the time. And we're, you know, and we're, I'm not going to say we're disposable, but we go in, we get a job done, and then they're not paying for retirement or other things down the road. So so that is, the again, another value prop. Instead of having a DOT that has 10,000 employees, you could get by with 2,000 or 4,000 that manage a t- workforce. Uh, it's broader. Much broader. Yes. And, much, and, and can have the knowledge and technology to do these things. Speaking of uh, value and and adding value, uh, let's go into some rapid fire and talk about some of the things that are important uh, at RSH and and, in in our essence in the value that we think about is is our uh, company and and our associates. We have this brand essence that we call driven to care. And when you hear driven to care, uh, what do you think? Oh, my gosh. Family. Family. I, I care about everybody. I think it's like my family. And, and at one point, 90 percent of the CM folks worked for me at one point in their career. So the, it matters to me. That I know wives names. I know kids names. I know where they went to school. And, and not just us, not just in CM across the, Dave Sweeney and I grew up together in RSNH. Lisa Robert worked together on many things. Um, but there's also inspectors I know that I'll call and say, hey, how you doing? How's your family? What's going on? So, it, And that driven to care as you look at your own family and your, as you talked about, not only being one of five kids, but having five and what you're doing with your family, you translate that to, to this driven to care philosophy that you bring to RSNH. And that's why I want to get home safe. I really, I really want them to be safe because I know. And they know my wife. Many of the wives, we have a leadership meeting, annual leadership meeting. They know my wife. They know that if there's a problem, they can call my wife Bridget and go, Bridget, help me. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, let me ask you about uh, another important uh, issue that we're concerned about, not only at RSNH, but in our entire industry and in the construction industry because of the the long hours and the kinds of things that we do uh, in the field, and that is mental health and wellness. What is the one thing that you do to support your mental health and wellness? No, hey, it's a highly stressful job. And when I was in the field, I would just go, okay, I'm going to go on a walkabout. Don't call me. And I would just walk the job along the roadway, and you see things differently. And that just let me let the day progress. I found a lot of things, flashlights, jewelry. I found, <laughs> people throw out the weirdest stuff. But that was a downtime for me. Um, when I was bicycle racing, I used to ride at lunch. That was another stress reliever. The guys the guys knew my route, so they'd make sure all the there wasn't any trash or debris along my route, including the contractor. Everybody knew my route. So, so those were things I would do to release stress during my day. Um, now, COVID, uh, working from home mostly, we have a horse ranch. With I'll go out and pet the horses, brush the horses, just get away from it a little bit. If, if you've ever had horses, you know, they just take all your worries away. That's right. So, yeah, so it's a way you can re-energize and either whether it be a walk or a bike ride or seeing your horses, it gives you a perspective, a, a step back, a time to reflect. You got to slow down every once in a while and just take time and sit back and reflect. And, and it could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It could be a half an hour. But lots of times we're in a very stressful situation on what we do. And, and you have to reflect a little bit. 
take the time, slow down, and, and, and it's okay. <laughs> and you know what, Brian? It's giving people permission to do that. I think that's empowering them and giving permission to slow down, take a break. Yeah, and the best way to do that, Doug, is is how you do it, and that is by example. I, I find that uh, when you do it by example, as Tony did to you, then you feel empowered to reflect yourself. Is that kind of how you operate when you're working with, with your teams? Absolutely. Absolutely. So last rapid fire question. Has a movie, book, podcast, TV show, is there one that's had a major impact on you in some way? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I can't remember any of them, but I, I love leadership stuff. I'll read all about leadership. Um, Brian O'Neill put a, uh, Robert O'Neill put a book out. Uh, I like the Lance Armstrong stuff about leadership, taking charge. Um, don't let, don't let, don't. And, and here again, and, and there's a couple of old school Western horse trainers that I follow. And, and one, like, be a pilot. Don't be a passenger on your horse. So, and that's, that's kind of in life. Be a pilot. Don't be a passenger on your life. <laughs> I like it. I like that notion. And, and you can easily relate to that. So when you're a pilot, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're alone necessarily, but you can take charge, right? You can take charge of what you're doing and have your priorities and share appropriately, have your family, be the pilot uh, for your, for your team, but be a pilot for yourself is what I hear you saying. Exactly. Yeah. That's to me. So I follow a lot of leadership stuff. That's what intrigues me. Well, you're a great leader, uh, Doug, for RSNH. You're a great leader in the construction and management industry and, and a great example for the kind of things that that we need to do to, to make our clients better to make our communities better. And I'm so grateful to have you on AEC Perspectives, sharing your insights, your own leadership philosophy, and your focus on family and safety, both at home and at work. This is Doug Geiger, who's a 40-year veteran of the construction management industry, sharing his insights on emerging trends in construction management for our industry. Doug, thank you so much for being here. Man, Brian, pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of AEC Perspectives. Follow or subscribe to AEC Perspectives wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember at RSNH, we are driven to care.